when he was there, he was absolutely defocused. He didn't have the energy. He didn't make decisions. It was like one bad thing coming in after the other. And that after a year, just everything on growth, German unification, everything was booming. And then there was the Gulf War. And that for airlines, crash. And that all of a sudden. So an airline that was set up for growth suddenly, cost, 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 down, 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 no more passengers. And that was going on for months. He shared how he went to banks, to the most important German banks, in order to get a bit more money to pay the salary of his staff. And he had something like two more weeks to go until money was down. So that was really close to bankruptcy. Bankruptcy of a German airline, that's like Aruda going bankrupt. Practically impossible, but in Germany at that time, it would have been absolutely possible. They made it. So there was the turnaround that he managed. And he shared with us how there was this one weekend with all that doom things coming in day after day. And he made the decision for himself, no, as long as I'm in this position here, this thing is not going to go down under. This thing is not going to go bankrupt. I love this airline, I love those people, let's make that happen. He made it happen. Six years afterwards, they had sort of the best revenues, the best profits, the best financials ever in history. When he talked then about his staff, the pride that he had in his staff, how they made it, how they made that turnaround. When he talked about the respect that he had for the customers, because the customers clearly and that he always mentioned are the ones that pay the salary slips. So he was talking about customers and he made a decision whenever they were overbooked and he was on the plane, although he had a really important meeting somewhere, he's going to get off the plane. He did that three times. You can imagine that story is still within Lufthansa as not only a myth, but it's true and it works. What really awed me at the time when I heard that, when he talked about all this turnaround, he talked actually quite, quite a lot about himself and how he managed himself at the time when he was spiraling down and how he was admitting that for weeks and weeks he was spiraling down and that that had clearly an impact on the organization itself and of the performance of this whole organization. So he admitted it. He was very, very authentic in that. We could all sort of feel his pain that he went through in the sleepless nights. So he was mainly talking about himself, on how to sort of get himself up. And it was this one weekend where he more or less made that decision and then sort of went into another mode and then sort of took his people with him. Let's test that. Now, how often do you have that, that sometimes, maybe a bit simplified, that you get up in the morning and before you go to work, you either have a little quarrel with your husband, your partner, or your kids just don't do exactly what you want to do and you're really furious about it. Does that ever happen? No. No, of course not. <laughs> it happens to none of us. So, even in the back, if you don't see the words, just look at the smileys and non-smileys, the frownies, yeah, sort of this is where you are. When you're down there, you can't really act. Yeah? You're almost paralyzed. If you're really furious, which sometimes happens, yeah, then you can't really act. So it's really about managing yourself, managing yourself up. Now, at the moment, where would you place yourself if you just look, if you look at the smileys? Where would you... About uh, above ground floor? Well, that's a good one. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have made it here. <laughs> what would your colleagues say about you at the moment? Check whether this is the same. Would they say the same thing about where you are currently? Am I? 
And what you have sort of said to yourself? Just check for yourself. Second one. In the last heavy struggle that you had, just think about that, where it was really tough at work. How did you catch yourself before you really went down? Did you catch yourself? And then if, how did you catch yourself? And to do that even on the long run, sometimes you are, like Jürgen Weber was, on a downward spiral for quite some weeks or months. What is it that helps you long term? What is it to keep you up there long term? So this is something that of course you can train. And, pro and I'm sure that sometimes there are situations where you're better with that and sometimes you really go down and you might even love it because you don't have the energy and then it gives you a reason for hiding a little bit. But of course managing yourself it's the important thing because in the end, if you know and if you reflect and you have the anchors on how to put yourself up and down and you can more or less play with it to a certain extent, that helps. And then if you know even better how your boss ticks or how your staff ticks on that and you can anchor them, you have some of those tools around it, that's going to help, won't it? Again, it's trainable. You can work on it. Now, that wasn't the only big goal that he had. A couple of years later, successful as they are, the market expected one thing, that was growth. Organic growth was not enough. What they asked is really big jumps. Now, because of the history that he had, just buying other airlines, although they had some money, was out of the question for him. He said, never again I'm going to put myself in a position where I have so much debt that I cannot sort of move around anymore. So that was something where he said, no go. But then, he came up with this idea of strategic alliances. This was the birth of the Star Alliance, and I'm sure you all know sort of the Star Alliance. It was the first alliance in the airlines, and it's probably the biggest as it is at the moment. But that was the birth. I will not forget, last week in my executive program, there were two guys from Ponto Ginda. They talked with so much admiration of Hachiputra, how he had, at the time where nobody believed that at all, this dream, this idea, let's set up a luxurious residential area with those two malls, not in the center of Jakarta, not around here, but somewhere outside. He made that happen. And he stayed with his dream. Besides everything, you know, the financial crisis here in Asia, and, then, and he managed to really work that through. But it was the admiration, the way they talked about it, and that dream that is still sort of within them now, which is almost 20 years later. Then I think of Igogita. She just got a new job in marketing. I'm working with her. She went into the job and she said, I want to make a difference, a big difference. I want to make mark. How exactly we're working on it. There's Pa Edmund in Pudogadum, he has to turn around the plant, which for the last two years is not performing. And if they don't change that, this whole thing is going to be closed. And then, there is Ibo Edmi. She is having this thing about, I am going to retire exactly in six months. I have been in this job for 30 years. I'm a sales manager for 30 years and I want to leave a legacy. She has that dream, she really wants to build this legacy. She is working on this now with all her heart. What they all have in common now is this one big idea. And they definitely believe that this idea is going to come true. They strongly believe in it. 
You can feel it when you talk to them. You can sort of look in their shiny eyes. When you do that, you are going to be bold. You're not just going to set yourself a little goal where you say, ah, I'm going to achieve this anyway. This is not going to drive you. All those people are setting themselves big goals. They all ask themselves, what is that one single biggest thing that I can do that really gives a breakthrough to whatever I am or to whatever idea I have? And the th second thing is, they are describing for themselves this outcome. When I work with them, there's usually three things that I'm looking at. One is passion. Do you have that passion for this one thing that you're dealing with? If you don't have it, forget it. You're not going to make it true. You're always going to be mediocre in what you're going to do here. The second one is describe the whole thing. See it. Hear it. What is it going to be? How does this organization look like? How is this, my, my dream going to look like? How are the people performing around me? How do the customers react to me when this is in place? In the nicest colors that you can, that you can draw. And the third thing, also, do like hell. What happens if none of this is going to come true? What impact does that have on me, on my career? on the people around me. On Park Edmund, if the plant is going to close, what does that have to do with all the families? Draw it, draw it. It's going to make you even stronger. It's going to make this idea even stronger. When Jürgen Weber said, we're going to turn around, he needed people around him. It was the samurai of change, they were called. There were the Explorers 21. I was part of it at Lufthansa at a little bit a different stage. There is the connectors right now in Astro, in KL. People that really combine the top management and the shop floor. There are the movers in Pudogadung. We're always working with the same kind of thing. People around it that are absolute allies of you. People that love that. People that are convinced. And how do we do that? Usually, in all those four things that I just described, we actually lock them in a room for something like two, three weeks to make things happen that usually in the workplace wouldn't happen. And those people who are part of the organization, who reflects the organization, put them together. They go through all this team stuff, up and down and up and down. They are screaming, they are yelling and they're loving themselves. Yeah, this is all going to happen in those two, three weeks when you really lock them in and they have a challenge, make this happen. So this is the Samurais. Build your own Samurais, if you have that. Gain the alignment around them and what will happen automatically is that you all get to know them, that you care about them and this is the important part in the future, knowing, caring about them. Last thing here, you can't see that. This is um, like in fitness first, like in celebrity, whatever. I'm talking here about my wife to come and I admire her for one big thing here when I look at the workplace. What she is managing is a quality, a passion that she is having and that she actually manages to install in all those trainers across Asia, whether it's Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Shanghai, um, it doesn't matter. They just go with it. And there's two things that she says, I hate it when people are just there and don't want to move. Don't want to move, not in the physical sense, but not here, and don't want to develop, don't want to grow. And what she loves the most is like what happened the other day when somebody from India comes back to her two years later and says, you know, I have been in, uh, sort of come up in this position, I have done this and this and that all because of the feedback you have given me. And she gives incredibly harsh feedback, not the feedback that I would expect in Asia. This is clear, this is harsh, but it works. 
in all those cultures here. And this is what's happening there. She says, if I spend time with them, they appreciate it. They appreciate that I just spend the time. The second thing is that I believe whatever I do and with whomever I work, there's a ground belief. I believe that they can be better than what they are at the moment. And the third thing is, there is something like disciplined execution around this. They do have the processes in place. They do have the structures there. They do have trainings like the 10,000 hour training in order to really be absolutely professional. It's all there. They have the assessment. They kick people out if necessary. And then, and then. So this is usually those high, high performance organizations are not organizations that are necessarily only the fun, comfortable ones. No, they push you, but they also push each other. And that's what's happening there. So, coming to the end, when I look at sort of the how do you energize those organizations, there's always three things that I see around it. One thing is, be the authentic best. Be bold with your ideas. Number one. Number two, you've got to search the alignment continuously with allies that help you with your dream. Alone, you will never make that. And third, it is that disciplined follow-through. It has a lot to do with execution. This is a marathon. This is never just a hop within five minutes. Although the decision to make something happen can happen in a minute. But then to actually make it happen usually is the marathon. And I'm sure there's probably amongst here when we ask many people with dreams and you're probably following up those dreams. And if we come here maybe a year later and we would share, then we would probably share some of the Chiputra ideas and you're making it happen. And I want to finish with this one sentence um, that one of the yeah, most admired CEOs um, that has really followed that through, this is David Novak from Yum uh, Corporation, and he says, be your own big goal, move me, and then move we. Thank you. Thank you very much.